Tim Pawan. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Noesis Center, Wright State. And uh, welcome to my uh, PhD defense. And I'm thankful to all of you to get up so early. And, and I'm specifically thankful to all the committee members, uh, my advisor, Dr. Ramachel, Dr. Derek Doran, and Dr. Prasad. And uh, Dr. Jain, uh, Pratik Jain, he is uh, on hangout. Uh, he's at Today I'll be talking about uh, personalized and adaptive semantic information filtering for social media. Uh, starting with uh, social media, we are all familiar, a lot more familiar at least, hear about social media websites such as Twitter, Facebook, or Google Plus. And, uh, these websites over time have become a lot popular because uh, they they bring in some features which are kind of very addictive for all of us. Uh, they let us interact, network, interact, and communicate with uh, with each other, and uh, they let us generate information so which which we can share with uh, each other and keep track of each other's updates. <coughs> So, being a prominent medium of generating information, social media is also a place where a lot of us consume a lot of information. One of uh, one of the way, one of the reasons we consume the information is to keep track of our, our friends and our acquaintances. Right? Uh, we want to know what's happening in our network, what 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 our friends are doing, family is doing, and as and when they share information, we we'll get to know in real time what's happening. The other reason is, is uh, a recent survey said around 86% of the Twitter users who participated in the survey, they, they said that they follow news on uh, Twitter. Right? So it also acts, uh, acts as a medium to share, share news. One in three of uh, the people on social media or the ones who were, uh, who were surveyed looked out for social media for medical information and uh, disaster management companies or disaster management people they often uh, are up on social media to actually get to know to help or coordinate disasters and uh, in our lab uh, we were working on how we can uh, filter information to get to know who is uh, who is actually offering help or seeking for help on social media during disasters. For Hurricane Sandy, there were around 20 million tweets which were actually generated uh, during Hurricane Sandy. And uh, again, most of the crisis management uh, people utilized Twitter in, in those scenarios. Right. So one common problem what people have or what we have, uh, we have, we have extensively spoken about this during our meetings that it's really hard for us to follow each and every information we, uh, we get on social media websites. Right? And uh, I think this is a really good quote by Simon, Robert Simon saying, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. The more and more information we have, the lesser we can be attentive towards all these information. Right? Users often complain about this information overload on social media websites. There are 5 billion posts which are being generated just on Twitter and Facebook. Right? And 5 billion a day is really, really huge. Right? And I personally have 1,000 plus people on my social network. It includes LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. And keeping track of, track of what each and every person is doing on these social networks is not easy for me. Right? So, in such scenarios, uh, previously, uh, when there is an enormous stream of information and when people want to uh, find relevant information, researchers have come up with information filtering systems. To give a short history about information filtering system, uh, the first uh, information, or first first time it was discussed, it was in 1950 by an IBM. Right? And as we know, researchers, uh, we are generally guinea pigs of our own, uh, our own research. So, what uh, people did uh, when they developed the information filtering system was that they tried to recommend uh, or they tried to filter 
scientific documents for researchers. And this was built by IBM, NASA, GM. So these are these are one of the few companies in the 1950s and 1960s uh, where they started, and it was actually called selective dissemination of information back then. What what we actually want to do on social media is exactly something similar, right? We want uh, to understand interests of users or of ourselves, and we want the system to actually tell us the information which is relevant to us, right? Uh, the traditional architecture of a uh, of a social media uh, or of an information filtering system is that there are two different uh, two two modules. One is the user interest identification module, and the other one is the filtering module. Right? The user interest identification module tries to extract user uh, user interest, tries to understand users, and filtering module filters information based on interests. To give an example, I have picked up a, a filtering system for a news website and. Uh, Example for news and if a user, if you get to know that the user is interested in uh, in a in a news article which talks about uh, NBA and basketball, what the user interest module, user interest identification module does is uh, it extracts uh, interests of users, saying that okay, since he's interested in that article, he's probably interested in NBA sports and basketball, and the filtering module as and when new information comes up, checks the relevance and delivers it to the user. We want a similar system for social media, and uh, in this dissertation, we will particularly focus on utilizing text for generating interests and filtering. Right? However, when we are looking at social media, social media has its own challenges because it's a new new platform, new kind of data is coming up. So I'll talk. I'll primarily talk about three prominent challenges. What information filtering systems face for social media. Yeah, based on social media characteristics, right? The first one is the lack of context, right? Uh, social media generates texts that are between around, you know, 60 to 140 characters long, and that, that is considered to be the ideal length what people should, uh, should generate on all these social media websites. It might be Twitter, Facebook, or Google+, Plus, so that your information is more propagated in the network. Having this short text, it's uh, it's really hard to process this text for any kind of information filtering tasks. And until now, as I mentioned, the information filtering is done on a traditional uh, text such as, which has a larger context such as, it might be emails, blogs, or news articles. And uh, these techniques which are actually developed for larger text and bigger context, it's really hard for it to work on short text. You know, given, given an example of great day for Chicago sports as well as Cubs beats the, beats the Red Sox, beats the Mariners and Herbers perfect game. This is, this is really short, it's around 100 characters and trying to understand this text and understand users based on this text is really hard. Right? So the second challenge which I'll be talking about is uh, is because social media is a real-time platform and most of us on these websites uh, share information which is about the real world happening. So it as and when things happen, we share information. And uh, we are also interested in such kind of topics. Right? So if you look at civil unrest such as Arab Spring or Indian election, US election happening right now, or Hurricane Sandy, people started sharing information about whatever is happening related to these events in real time. When such things happen, if you want to filter information since we are interested in these, these topics, it's really hard. I'll just give an example of Hurricane Sandy. Right? There are four different, uh, four different phases in the disaster and Hurricane Sandy went through all these phases. It might be mitigation, preparedness, recovery and response. And as and when each of these phases came up, uh, the, the representative vocabulary on social media changed. Frank and Storm and Sandy was, uh, at least ha hashtag Sandy was popular throughout the phase, whereas uh, stay safe and red, red cross were between prepar preparedness and recovery, and uh, thanks Sandy and restore the store was between recovery and response. If you want to keep track of this whole event or if you want to filter information of this whole event or a whole topic, we 
you have to keep track of each and every phase or each and every event associated to the main topic, right? Um, giving an example of Indian elections, there were multiple issues which were happening, right? The, the announcement of uh, prime ministerial candidates, uh, issues regarding corruption and polls in different states. So, if you, if I want to track Indian elections on social media, I have to know what all is happening, and I have to keep track of these things and the representative vocabulary so that I can try to relevant information. The third challenge I'll be talking about is more on the practical aspects of a filtering system. So. There are a huge set of users on social media. Facebook has more than a billion. If you, if you would consider Facebook as a country, it would have been, it would be the second largest country in the world by now. And uh, Twitter has around uh, 500 million users. If you want to, if you want to develop an information filtering system for such a large set of users, we will have to scale the dissemination of content to these set of users. So, however, the current capability of centralized systems are, are limited. So you need to scale the dissemination of content if you have to develop a filtering system. Uh, in this uh, to address these challenges, uh, in this dissertation we will uh, focus on utilizing knowledge bases and semantic web technologies. We want to explore the, power, the value of knowledge bases. When I when I talk about utilizing knowledge bases, I am focusing on how can we get more context or more information about a particular text. Okay. If I uh, if you look at uh, this tweet, uh, if you get to know that the Cubs mentioned in in the tweet is actually Chicago Cubs, can we get more information about that entity or about that particular concept? Uh, if you have a knowledge base which says that Chicago Cubs is related to baseball and baseball is related to sports or the two players in Chicago Cubs are uh, Jason Herbert and Chris Bryant, we can utilize this information uh, as context for the tweet and try to understand the tweet better. So that's, that's what I mean by utilizing knowledge base. However, there are a lot of knowledge bases on the web and uh, we really need to drill down to knowledge base which, are, which is which is very suitable for our task. The two primary requirements for us uh, when we are working on social media is the diversity. I did mention uh, that there are a lot, there are a large set of users on, on social media websites, and each of these users have different topics. So we need to make sure that the knowledge base we are trying to use is diverse enough to cover such topics of interest for a large set of users. The next thing is uh, social media is a very real time platform and we want the knowledge base to be updated in real time too. Right? Uh, Wikipedia can play as a knowledge source that can actually satisfy both of these requirements for us. It's diverse because it's collaborative in nature and there are more than 80,000 volunteers uh, who have updated uh, more than 5 million articles on Wikipedia. <coughs> So each of these articles are topics which we, which we might be interested in. And uh, they have near right real-time updates with unbiased views right? uh, because it's collaborative with you. Keeping this uh, in mind, uh, my TC statement is as follows. To build an effective information filtering system, background knowledge with semantic web technologies can be used to address lack of context, dynamic changing vocabulary, and scalability challenges introduced by social media, short text, and real-time news. And accordingly, I have organized the outline based on the challenges I'll be addressing. The first one is the short, uh, short text or uh, lack of context for processing. Second one is the continuously changing vocabulary. And the third one is scalability in terms of dissemination of content. Right? And uh, these are the publications I have uh, for each of these, uh, as in when I have addressed each of these challenges. The first challenge, the lack of context, uh, I have uh, spoken a part of it in my, I've actually explained a part of it in my proposal. I have uh, covered uh, the real-time and dynamic nature uh, topic in my proposal too. So here I'll be uh, focusing, uh, in this talk, uh, the dissertation talk, I'll be focusing on 
the extension what I have done for lack of context uh, challenge in, in order to address the lack of context challenge and the scalability issue. So starting with uh, how I have tried to address the lack of context challenge, uh, primarily we utilize text uh, to understand user interest and better. Right? And uh, we have to address lack of context challenge for, for the same task, to understand user interests and filter information. So, what we try to do in this dissertation is to utilize text, right? When we utilize text from social media posts, this is a tweet, uh, as and when we read the tweet, we can easily generate, generate context based on the background knowledge we have as humans saying that this tweet is about baseball. But for machines, this is hard. And we can actually do this utilizing the Wikipedia category structure. <coughs> Wikipedia itself, I think people, uh, people uh, I think, for people to update Wikipedia with categories associated to each topics. And if you look at Cubs or Reds, you'll get to know that they are, they are related to Major League Baseball and Intern Baseball. So we want to build a hierarchical context for a tweet and see how well this hierarchical context helps to understand user interests and filter information. Uh, given these two tweets are from a user, uh, I will first explain how the existing state-of-the-art uh, techniques are for user interest identification. Right? We can categorize uh, the state-of-the-art techniques into four different categories. The first one is the term-based uh, representation of user interests. What term-based representation does is uh, it picks up each term in the tweet which the user has uh, mentioned and uh, it, utilized, it utilizes those as interests and the frequency is the number of times that particular term has appeared in user's tweets. The next set of, uh, the next category of representing user interests is transforming the user tweets into a lower dimensional space. So it might be LSA, LDA, or uh, all these uh, mechanisms can be utilized to cluster tweets into different dimensions and the distribution of the dimensions are the scores with which the user is interested in that particular dimension of the interest. The third set which is more interesting to us is uh, the entity based uh, representation of tweets, uh, representation of interests. Uh, the the major advantage what entity-based re representation provides is uh, that it'll it'll actually relate uh, or it'll link the the terms in the tweets to entities in a knowledge base. For example, Cubs. We get to know that it's Chicago Cubs and Cincinnati Reds. Reds are Cincinnati Reds and Sox are White Sox. Probably in Wikipedia, Wikipedia there are there are many knowledge bases with which we can associate. Uh, these entities do. The major advantage is that these interests will be unambiguous for us. Socks can also be uh, red socks or white socks. But you know, if you look at entity extraction techniques where we can extract those entities, what they provide is to disambiguate that between red socks and white socks and say that okay, since the person is talking about Chicago sports, it's probably white socks. These these entities and knowledge base have more information associated to it. Uh, that is what we are interested in. So how can we build upon this, these entities based uh, entities interest representation and utilize the knowledge associated with these entities? For example, can we get to know that these entities mentioned here are for Major League Baseball teams and that's associated with Major League Baseball and in turn that's associated. I'm, I'm more focusing on the broader related interests of the entities mentioned in the tweet. Right? And if we are able to do that, if we are able to say that the person who's talking about, uh, the, who's uh, sharing these tweets are interested in Major League Baseball teams, we can get more <coughs> interests such as those which is which I've not mentioned in this tweet. Right? San Francisco Giants and Oakland Athletics are with Major League Baseball teams, so we can probably recommend or filter information even for those ones we get to know if he's interested in Major League Baseball teams. If he's probably 
more in generic interested in this bot, we can also recommend information about these two organizations. Right? And in order to do that, uh, the methodology uh, we, uh, we utilized, which I which had already explained and I'll be summarizing it, is the first thing is we outsourced entity extraction uh, task to there are, there are multiple entity extractors online, Zamanta, the PDS spot, right? I've used Zamanta. Once we, uh, once we extract the entities from tweets, we score them based on normalized term frequency. And uh, we get the taxonomical information or the broader interests from Wikipedia. Wikipedia has, uh, has categories such as major league baseball teams, major league baseball and baseball. However, Wikipedia is collaborative in nature, so it's very messy. So we transform the category structure, which is actually a graph to a hierarchy. We, we, we could get to know the abstractness of users' interests once we transform it to the hierarchy. And uh, the next thing what we wanted is to score the set of interests. Right? That's, that's one of the contributions of this work. And in order to score, we utilize spread, spreading activation. Spread, what spreading activation does is, based on the scores in the leaf nodes, uh, it will propagate those scores of the hierarchy. Once it propagates, uh, we had to, uh, the, the propagation is actually controlled by an activation function. So we need to de divide an <coughs> activation function which handles the structure of the Wikipedia, Wikipedia categories. So we utilized four different, uh, we came up with four different parameters uh, to address this issue. The first one is uh, the raw, raw normalization and log normalization. This is particularly because there was uneven distribution of nodes in the hierarchy. There were 16 levels of, uh, 16 levels of, 16 hierarchical levels and uh, the node distribution was a bell curve. So we wanted to normalize it. So we used, uh, uh, we came up with these two normalization <coughs> parameters. The second one is there was many to many relationship. Each category had multiple super categories <coughs> and multiple subcategories. When we are propagating up the up the hierarchy, for example, if, if a person is interested in Boston Red Sox, Boston Red Sox has major league baseball teams as one of its categories and 1901 establishments in Massachusetts as the other one, which is more interesting for users. So, you know, intuitively we can easily get to know that major league baseball is more interesting to the user. We used a convention of Wikipedia categorization where it, where it says that the leftmost category on Wikipedia is more important to the rightmost one. And the leftmost is actually Major League Baseball and the rightmost is 1901 categorization. We captured this intuition with preferential part constraint. And the final one is boosting common ancestors where, uh, where we assume that uh, the intuition is the categories which which is an intersection of all the entities of interest of the user is more prominent. Utilizing these four uh, parameters, we came up with three activation functions. Right? The first one uses the raw normalization. Second one uses the log normalization. The third one utilizes log normalization with preferential path and intersect booster. We evaluated this using the user study. Oh, sorry. Now what we have is uh, we have three activation functions which uh, scores the categories in the hierarchy. Right? So we evaluated how well these categories are scored based on a user study which had 30, 37 users, around 32,000 tweets. And uh, the graph below where the x-axis is the number of tweets and the y-axis is the number of users shows uh, the level of activities of users on Twitter. This, this, this provides us the diversity in our data set where we say that seven users tweeted between 1 to 100 and the other seven had between 2,000 to 3,300. Twitter search API gave us the option to just get 3,300 tweets per because that's where we start. What we found is uh, Priority Intersect performs the best in terms of getting uh, identifying user interests in a hierarchy, but our main focus was to get information which were not present in tweets. What I mean by that is, if a user has tweeted uh, something about Major League Baseball and we are able to get the category Major League Baseball as his interest, it's explicitly mentioned in his tweet, right? 
So I can syntactically say that the user is interested in basic baseball. However, if a user is interested in such a tweet, which does not mention anything about baseball, but I'm still able to get an implicit information about it, that's what I, that's what we were looking for, to develop a hierarchy of context, which is not mentioned by the user. Right. When we evaluated the number of uh, interests which were not mentioned in user tweets, what we found was uh, Bell uh, gets around 8 of the 10 interests at top 10 which were not mentioned in tweets, whereas priority instead gets around 5 out of the top 10 which were not mentioned in tweets. So, the, the black line here shows, uh, oh that's your general alala, alarm. <laughs> you have to sing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have made sure people wake up a lot earlier than <laughs> they generally do. So, the black line shows us uh, the number of implicit interests, uh, the percentage of implicit interests at top end, uh, how many interests which were not mentioned in user tweets. Right? Whereas uh, the blue dots show how many of those are relevant to the users. If you look at, uh, at top 50, around seven, more than 70% of the interests, what priority intersect were they able to uh, capture were not mentioned in user tweets and with a precision or with, with a relevancy of 60%. Right? What we now have is we have tried to generate a hierarchical context for users and where 70% of the interests we generated were not mentioned in user tweets. We came up with a new way to represent Twitter user interests, which is in, in terms of hierarchy. Uh, but having user interests is useless unless we apply it to something. So we uh, we came up with a tweet recommendation approach, where we first uh, <coughs> generate a hierarchical interest graph for a user based on his tweet, tweets, and for each incoming tweet which we want to recommend, we generate a hierarchical context using the priority intersect activation function which performed the test for us. We transform these hierarchies to a vector of uh, interests and with scores. Compare them using Pearson correlation which is one of the prominent uh, way to uh, find similarity for recommendation systems. And uh, we recommend based on the value of these correlations. Question is, so, mm -hmm. so, um, did you find any optimal uh, levels? You said five to nine levels. Any yes. that is pretty high. Potential nine is very high. Um, uh, there was a project we done called Observer. We had uh, uh, you know created a little concepts, but every time mm -hmm. you add more things, then mm -hmm. we Yes. So when we started, uh, so uh, if you look at uh, Bell and Bellog normalizers, yeah. right? We started with just uh, pushing information up the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. If you push information up the hierarchy or keep summing values, generally we get the top most category as an interest because all the values are actually being accumulated at the top of the hierarchy, right? That didn't work properly, right? Because most of the interests are very generic and people started giving maybe and no, right? So that's the reason we used Bell and Bell Lock. And uh, the, the prominent thing what we found when we, uh, when we looked at uh, how users annotated their interests was that if the interests are between that mid-level hierarchies between 4 and 9 or 4 and seven, four and 8, we were able to get most of the relevant interests. That's what priority in the second. You get more relevant interests, but that will be because of high recall, but you will get more decisions. Uh, the things of increasingly less interest that will come up, that might likely be relevant, but not very highly relevant. So you are saying that it's uh, the difference between popularity stuff? You will get 
You're explaining the school why you wouldn't love the hierarchy. Right. So it's the more you cause of less decision. So you need to give that the other things that belong to that high level in your hierarchical role uh, that the user may not have explicitly shown interest in. So, for example, I, I, I'm interested in, let's say, uh, social media or some medical web, but I may not be interested in this computer science. Uh, I can go to... I am still not generating the lower level categories. If I tell that you are interested in computer science... That's high level. That's yes. Very yes. I have asked you whether it's relevant or not, right? So, based on a category. If it's not relevant, you would have told it's not relevant. Where is the user selection? He asked uh, 37 users whether... No, you didn't ask them to review the hierarchy and say... That I did. Yes. Yeah. I told that these are categories on Wikipedia. So che check them on Wikipedia and then so the, annotate so with the it. the person whose interests are... Uh, uh, you know, whose interests you are capturing mm -hmm. uh, in hierarchy and this and you, are, you have them uh, curate their own hierarchy. I have them annotate the hierarchy or the top 50 interests which I have provided to them based on the hierarchy and I requested that I, uh, in, in my uh, user study manual I have told them that each of these interests are from Wikipedia category and I gave them the category link to check whether they are relevant to them or not and that's exactly the reason we gave uh, an option of maybe to them right? Okay. I mean, let me paraphrase what you are asking basically the question is why didn't you pick the lower level, uh, that is, why did you pick the higher level one? Mm -hmm. And so did you find that the higher level ones actually reduced recall? I mean, did you observe that? I think you were addressing... Level will take increased recall, right? Go to no, higher level for him is process. going lower in the, in the hierarchy. I have not recommended anything, right? For me to... Okay, basically very specific ones you ignore. Mm -hmm. I did not. Yeah, yeah very specific ones you ignored. You went intermediate abstraction, you ignored the top one. Right? That was it. Very general is not good, very specific is not good. And you found the intermediate one. No, I think you get the more specific ones. Yeah, not necessarily. No, the, you, your claim is that the intermediate ones are the right fit. The intermediate ones might be the most specific one too. How? Oh, no, The yeah. ones that you recommended were based on the activation function, right? Yes. Whatever the activation. So how was the activation function designed so that maybe something in the middle of the hierarchy could get the highest score, right? Th what that's mechanisms exist to prevent the most general one from always being scored the highest? That, that's the normalization uh, factor which I mentioned. Okay. Right? Uh, so... So something in here. Yes. No, I here's my understanding. Es yes. Essentially, you have uh, several levels of abstraction. You're right. And uh, you had some user uh, study that said which ones they prefer uh, as the right level. You're right. And you I wanted to automate didn't say which, which no, no, they have that. The user study has uh, implicitly that. And what you want to do is how do I quantify it hmm. in order to programmatically determine the appropriate level. And you experimented yes. with a number of parameters and number of activation functions and and what you found was that the activation function that somehow gave uh, preference to the intermediate ones is the one that you user You're appreciated. Right. And You're so right. you said that, so here are the choices that I have made, right. and here is the number combination that I have made, which is what is uh, preferable to the users. And that's yes. why I want to use this algorithmic technique to satisfy the users. Basically. That's how yes, I but I never gave them the hierarchy of levels to check. Right. I didn't tell that. No, you gave them the final result of what you're you right. Yeah. You're right. You're so, right. So, from, right. from those user study, I infer right. that these are the uh, right. category levels which are more interesting to the user. Right. Right. Is there any way to capture um, uh, the human involvement uh, and uh, how any um, <coughs> methodological issue about uh, you know, what users chose, how uh, how 
your technique allowed them to stake their broader interest versus more specific interest? How my technique allowed them to state more broader interest than specific interest? Yeah, I mean, you, you came with a set of terms and they selected which one they are interested in. All right. And uh, in that, did, the, did anything, did, did you gain any insights as to whether you, you know you were able to um, capture better, uh, more general user interest without um, losing out too much on decision? Um, you know, because user may choose a high interest and now because yeah, I'll, I'll step user back is not more content. Right. And now he's not happy, the user is not really fine, you know, he's just overwhelmed. And you may not be able to rank. Uh, suppose my capacity is to only consume top 20 pieces every day, mm. um, even though I'm getting 200. Mm. Uh, while your recall will be higher naturally by giving them, you know, able to select many more concepts. That they are actually interested in without explicitly specifying them. Mm. Uh, because of more terms that are used now to filter, um, you would also have um, more recall but lesser precision because uh, there will be a lot of other things. And suddenly I start seeing some past parts of computer science that I am not interested in. There is a possibility of that. Is, that, is, that, is, that, is that an impact of that that needs to be studied? Yes. And uh, I've tried to study the tweet recommendation system. Okay, I'll, I'll step back and uh, uh, and probably I'll this is this is my uh, issue in understanding the questions, right? What do you mean by precision and recall? Uh, I'll get more. I mean, you just selected X number of. Yeah, yeah I haven't. I, I think I'll be talking about the recommendation system now. Mm -hmm. So at the end of it, I think we can. Uh, I'll I'll try I'll try to answer mm -hmm. your question. Right, because I, I think the precision and recall you are trying to ask is more more in, more relevant to the recommendation system than doing a user study. Okay. So yes, okay. We uh, came up with a tweet recommendation approach uh, which utilizes uh, the hierarchical interest graph which was generated uh, uh, in the yeah, utilizing the spreading activation algorithm. And uh, we compared it to uh, the state-of-the-art approaches, content-based approaches in terms of tweet recommendation. One is uh, based on term frequency, entity frequency, SVM rank, and uh, LDA. And uh, we utilized the same set of tweets which were utilized for the user study. That was the 37 users and 30,000 tweets. We came up with two different assumptions. One is the user-generated content assumption to, to actually divide the data set into training and testing. What the user-generated content assumption states is that the tweets which are interesting to the, uh, to the user are relevant to the user. So we took 80%, if a user has 100 tweets, we took 80 tweets of his to create user profiles and 20 as test tweets that they are relevant to him. Right? The next one is the retweet assumption. While the user generated content assumption is more implicit, that I assume that whatever you share are interesting to you, retweet is more explicit and it is a more popular assumption in tweet recommendations, which states that if you are retweeting a particular user's tweet, you are actually interested in it. That is when you retweet it, right? So around 30% of the 32,000 tweets, that's around 9,000 were retweets, and 70% were used to create user profiles. We used uh, a popular uh, top end recommendation in, uh, evaluation methodology where for every test, test tweet, what I mean by test tweet is the tweet which is relevant to the user, we picked 1000 random tweets which the user has not tweeted about, which the user has not tweeted. So those 1000 tweets, we assume it to be non-relevant to the user. Right? So, and then using the recommendation algorithm, we uh, Rank, score and rank these 1001 tweets. At top end, if we get the test tweet, we consider it to be relevant to the, uh, we consider it to be a hit by the recommendation algorithm. And the recall is the number of hits we have by the total number of uh, test, uh, test cases. What we found is uh, at top 20, uh, that's, uh, that's the general thing. Uh, 
Profit has mentioned top 20 tweets is the limit. So at top 20, uh, top frequency performed uh, pretty well, but from top <coughs> 1 to top 10, the hierarchical interest graph performed better, right? uh, uh, slightly better. Uh, but overall, uh, term frequency performed well. Uh, that's pretty surprising that, you know, just to term frequency well, there is LDA, SVM, how can term frequency perform so well? But I think there are other papers which have also mentioned that term frequency performs pretty uh, significantly well. Is there a reason that trends aren't monotonically increasing with tech? Yes. Because uh, if you look at recall, it's the number of its. Uh, by the uh, total number of uh, test cases, and at one will be added to two. Two will be uh, added. I see, I see, I see. And at twenty, yeah, yeah. it's actually the sum of everything by the total number of. Tests, right? the denominator is changing. Yes. <laughs> it's so, just that the uh, number shows up in five is less than the Exactly. Yes, I think that's the. And if you look at the UGC assumption. Uh, it's, it's almost the same where the term frequency based approaches perform the best at top 20 and hierarchical, the hierarchical interest graphs are approach perform better under top 10. So the term frequency based approach is purely based on content whereas the hierarchical interest graph is based on knowledge base too. So what we, what we did is uh, we merged the term frequency profiles with the hierarchical interest graph. Since the scoring was different, we normalized relative to the maximum scored uh, interest and uh, we merged the term frequency and HIG uh, after normalizing. Right? And we utilized this to recommend uh, tweets to users and we found a significant uh, improvement in it. So content plus knowledge was able to improve the recommendation system for retweet assumption by more than 40%. And for user generated content assumption by more than 20 percent. So, to summarize the whole first part, uh, what we found was we found a new way to represent tweets. We tried to address the lack of context using hierarchical context of tweets. We, 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 we picked up a tweet and we got it as, as much uh, hierarchical relevant concepts to the tweet as possible and then we utilized it for tweet recommendation approach and we saw that the knowledge base can improve tweet recommendation approaches. Right. So, hey, just one clarification. So, yes. so you use the tweet that people generate and people retweet to build your hierarchical interest graph or you just use that for testing? <coughs> So in the user generated content assumption, I don't make any difference between retweets and normal tweets. Right, but you use this to build the hierarchical interest graph or just in the deck? Uh, I take 80% of it to build your hierarchical interest graph and 20% of oh. it to test. Right. Whereas in retweet, uh, retweets assumption, I clearly make that distinction. Right. The so ones you have retweet is used as test tweets. The ones you have not is used to create your profile. So, the next topic which I'll be summarizing is uh, the addressing the continuously changing vocabulary for filtering dynamic topics on Twitter. Right? So, uh, so on social media as a real-time platform, and we generate a lot of information based on the happenings in in and around us. I think Twitter which is uh, an application constantly most of us has worked, uh, have worked on uh, started because people were tweeting real time information about <laughs> Mumbai terrorist attacks in So to filter information of such topics which are real time and dynamically evolving, when, when I talk about real time and dynamically evolving I talk about Indian elections where there are many uh, sub-events which are associated to the Indian election and Hurricane Sandy which has different phases. Uh, what uh, social media allows or specifically uh, we have worked on Twitter is it allows users to get information based on keywords, right? So 
if you had to cross for Indian election, it will be Ashington election or Sandy, it would be Hash Sandy. However, these keywords change over time as and when things are happening, so anything associated to these emails. And if we want to filter information, keeping the coverage of these events, we have to keep track of these uh, uh, keywords and make sure the, the filter is updated which can help us get more information about, about the particular email, right? So what we did is we utilized hashtags as keywords. Uh, if we would have utilized generic keywords there, it would have been really noisy. And uh, hashtags are, uh, in any ways, they represent a topic, and that's the reason Twitter came up and added it as a standard feature. And we looked at how hashtags behave uh, during uh, events or during dynamic topics so that get to know, we, we can come up with an approach to detect them automatically. We utilized, we did an analysis of with over 6 million tweets for Colorado shooting and Occupy Wall Street. Uh, these were tweets which were manually curated and uh, the insights we found was topic relevant hashtags which we need to detect automatically uh, co-occur with each other. So if we start with one particular hashtag, we can get to the other hashtags through, through co-occurrence. The other insight is that less than 1% hashtags follow a parallel distribution on, uh, during these dynamic topics and less than 1% of topic relevant hashtags can crawl up to 85% of the tweets. Right? So if you start with one good hashtag, we can get other related hashtags and crawl the information. So we came up with an approach uh, where uh, we expect a manually, manual filter or uh, and a hashtag which is provided by the user which is relevant to the event and we look at uh, we, we look at the other co-occurring hashtags right uh, however there are too many co-occurring hashtags so we came up with a threshold that we'll be talking about in a bit and uh, just using co-occurrence we also got a lot of noisy hashtags so we needed some kind of background, background knowledge which will help us check whether the hashtag is relevant to the topic or not so we utilize Wikipedia, which has real-time updates on topics. And uh, we, plan, we, uh, we get the hyperlink structure of Wikipedia, which is updated as and when uh, information on Wikipedia is updated. Transform this to a vector of uh, entities and scores. The scores reflect the uh, relatedness to the top. To represent the hashtag to a similar set of entities, we utilized the uh, latest K tweets, uh, considering that the latest K tweets reflect what the hashtag is talking about. We got all the co occurring entities for it and scored them based on its normalized frequency. We compared uh, the background knowledge with the representation of the hashtag to check whether the hashtag is similar to it or not. So we did a real-time simulated setup for two events, that's uh, US elections 2012 and Hurricane Sandy. We got top 25, the hash threshold of 25 hashtags and uh, we manually annotated some tweets to check uh, whether it's uh, whether the tweets crawled by the hashtags are relevant or not. We found that the ranking approach we used uh, or the semantic similarity approach we used, the R approach used had a mean average position of uh, 0.92 for the top five hashtags. It, it, it was able to get uh, you know tweets with a mean average position of 0.92. Whereas if you look at uh, the co-occurrence technique, which is the baseline, it is able to get around 0.8 or 0.79 uh, uh, tweets with a mean average position of 0. .7. Utilized map and NDCG both to actually uh, evaluate this approach. What we found. Uh, with this work is that co-occurrence technique can be used to detect even relevant hashtags and more popular hashtags for a particular event are easier to be detected via co-occurrence. We use Wikipedia as a, a dynamic knowledge base and determine relevant hashtags by the top 5k content tweets, around 3500 more tweets with a precision of 0 0.92. Right. A similar framework we utilized for location prediction of Twitter users, so this was uh, one of the works with work which I did with a master's student. This is published in these studies. Right. Until now, I've spoken about how
trying to address lack of context and we continuously changing vocabulary uh, challenges for, for social media filtering. The final one I'll uh, talk about is how to scale an information filtering dis uh, system to disseminate information to a large set of users. So the existing systems, uh, it, it, it also includes the social networks which tries to disseminate information are centralized. This puts up a lot of load on either the server or the client because the server has to push information or the client has to pull information. So what we used, uh, what we did was to use uh, a protocol by Google which is called Pops Up Hubbub. Uh, interesting name but uh, that's like publisher, subscriber and hub is in between the publisher and subscriber. It was introduced in 2009. And uh, when I worked on it, that's in 2011, there were around 117 million users and 5.5 billion posts broadcasted using the Pops Up Hubbub. Right. What this does is uh, it uh, reduces the load on the publisher and the subscriber and there is a hub in between which, uh, which is contacted by the publisher as in when there is content at the publisher end. The hub receives the content and takes the load of broadcasting it to the, to the rest of the subscribers. Right? So this hub can be distributed. So instead of the server sending information to 10,000 su subscribers, it can just send, send information to 10 hubs which can send, which can broadcast it to 10,000 subscribers. We transform this to make the hub a filtering, uh, filtering module. Right? So the publisher, what it does is it pre-processes information. For example, in our tweet, it pre-processes tweet and gives the topics and preference of the tweet. The hub picks it up, checks who are all interested in this topic from the social graph it has. The social graph has to be created by the hub based on the subscriber's tweets. And disseminates it to only those subscribers who are interested in the topic. Right? A simple mechanism is uh, transforming uh, the publisher, transforming the tweet to RDF by the publisher where you get to know that the tweet is mentioning the media Chicago, Chicago Cubs and Cincinnati Reds and this, uh, the vocabulary used is the same which is used by Smog which is a semantic uh, microblogging framework for uh, a distributed framework and uh, what the hub does is picks up the tweet and based on the uh, entities or the topics mentioned in the tweet gets the users who are interested in those from its social graph and delivers it to the relevant subscribers. So we came up with a framework for distributed dissemination of content using Pops Up Above, uh, which is a pretty popular uh, distributed dissemination protocol and the semantic hub is used as privacy aware uh, dissemination for distributed social networks. That was uh, the ISWC paper and it is also used for real time. So to conclude uh, the talk, uh, this is the TC statement. I, uh, I tried to use, I've, I've utilized uh, background knowledge to address the lack of context uh, challenge <laughs> for social data filtering where we found that 70% of the top 50 interests we, we extracted were implicit and not mentioned by the users. And we improved, utilized using this the implicit interest, we improved the content-based tweet recommendation system by more than 40%. Utilize background knowledge for dynamically cha dynamic changing vocabulary, where we did hindsight analysis of hashtags and found that co-occurrence can be used as a technique, and we used background knowledge to find the semantic similarity of hashtags to the topic, found that top five detected hashtags by our technique uh, instantly got a 3500 more tweets with a mean average precision of 0.92. And uh, we extended the pops up above using semantic web technologies uh, to, for distributed uh, content dissemination for filtering. Yep, and that's the, almost the end of the talk in terms of the content. I have had a wonderful graduate journey here. The first part of the work was uh, done with IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Uh, Pratik Jain, uh, who was one of the committee members, was significantly involved with that. Location prediction of Twitter users, I worked at Noesis. These are different topics I worked on at Noesis over, 
over my term here and uh, I worked on determining Twitter user hobbies. So this is uh, one of the work I did with uh, Samsung Research and tweet filtering and recommendations which utilizes the hierarchy and interest graphs. Done multiple internships uh, at Dairy, IBM and a couple of them at Samsung and uh, have given invited talks at uh, PJ Watson and uh, EMC. Worked on three proposals here at Moises, NSF and NIH and developed a research system Quarkle, which, uh, which we developed with Pablo in 2010, one or triplication challenge uh, at iSemantics. Had multiple collaborations. Uh, the pops up hub I spoke about uh, was a collaboration with Google and Dairy. Worked with IBM Research, Samsung Research, Ohio State and CITER. I worked with uh, for the proposals. And these are my publications, the references, and uh, I thank my committee members, uh, particularly uh, starting with uh, Dr. Sheth. Uh, I don't think I would have done my PhD if uh, you know if I would not have had his motivation at the time uh, when I was confused. I'm still confused, uh, but uh, <laughs> at the time when I was very confused, he, he craved a better path for me. And uh, Dr. Prasad, uh, uh, for all the discussions about uh, the work I've had, and it's been wonderful. And the last year uh, with Derek, uh, one thing I'm continuously postponing with him is a journal paper which is written and he has put a lot of effort on it so and uh, not the least uh, Pratik Jain I think he has been a significant uh, mentor and a friend uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's been wonderful a uh, lot of people have helped me out through this uh, graduate uh, studies starting with Pablo uh, uh, I don't, I don't know how to thank each of them here, but I'll just mention their names and uh, it has been a wonderful journey. I think uh, Pablo Otto for Fabrizio, uh, while Pablo taught me how to code, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not sure whether I know code yet, but he taught me something. <laughs> Fabrizio taught me how to write papers. Pascal, Alexander Passant, he was my supervisor at uh, Dairy. Chitra, she was my manager at uh, IBM. Joachim and uh, Edwin, they were my supervisors at, uh, uh, at Samsung and Valerie for uh, her discussions in terms of uh, my job search and presentations and giving me more and more confidence every time I lost some. <laughs> right. I've worked very closely with some of the students here uh, and uh, I, each of them in their own ways have taught me a lot of things, lessons for life and lessons for <laughs> uh, lessons professionally. Uh, Pramod Konero, the first master student I worked with, uh, Sanjaya Revati, uh, yeah, she's my wife, I still work with her here. Uh, work with her here and at home, uh, and at home I used to work more than she did. She did work. <laughs> uh, uh, Sarasi, Shiva, uh, it's been a wonderful journey and thank you to all of you uh, who are here uh, and uh, thanks, I'm open to questions now. If I miss, if I miss anybody, I'm sorry.
How you can normalize each of them to seek further information in Wikipedia? It is because most of the hashtags, uh, to my knowledge, contains from a set of terms, not only one. Term. So uh, that's that's more on you know uh, the splitting end graphs. Right? I I didn't do that. What I did is I picked up the hashtag and. Uh, looked at co-occurring entities to check how that particular hashtag can be represented in Wikipedia. You can either take the hashtag and split it and say, check, okay, this particular hashtag means this on Wikipedia, or utilize uh, the co-occurring entities in its tweets. Right? I utilize the co-occurring co entities in its tweets. So you didn't the co is the hashtags, co-occurring with entities. And so if there is a hashtag, and if there are three, uh, the tweet, I looked, I looked at the entities which are mentioned with the hashtag, okay. uh, not not the hashtag and what. So what was the reason for doing that, like not splitting up it into the engrams? Uh, no reason. I started with this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Co-occurrence threshold there uh, is. Like a count or? Yes, I used uh, top 25 as the threshold to check and we found that at top 5 that will be the value, top 10 that will be the value in top 25. Oh, good. I, I, was, I was waiting for the... Uh, uh, but I'm the first adventures. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is related to what, what Alan asked about. Um, so you use recall metrics for evaluating the hierarchical news graph, but you use precision for evaluating the terminology vocabulary. I use precision to evaluate uh, the hierarchical interest graphs and recall to evaluate the recommendation system. Okay. Why? The difference, because there is a trade-off, right? The more, you know, the more you favor hits, the, the you increase fossil arms, and if you so both bo the places, it's exactly not uh, precision and recall. Like they mentioned recall here in terms of whether we can we are able to pick that test tweet in top twenty. Okay. So am I am I making sense? So, so if you if you look at it here. It's it's exactly not recall. It's really hard to uh, hard to uh, evaluate a recommendation system or a filtering system using recall specifically on Twitter because you really cannot get to know what are all the tweets out there that I can I can recall about a particular person or a particular topic, right? So <clears throat> the recall is actually not recall here. So it's kind of uh, it's just called recall because we are able to recall that tweet in the top 20, right? Uh, and uh, why did I utilize uh, precision here is uh, particularly because I don't think I can evaluate recall. So conceptually, yes. you don't know how to set up a, a recall, recall based experiment. We can, we can tell that we have improved. Uh, if you look at the dynamic uh, topic of interest, <clears throat> oh, oh, one second. So I can I can still tell that the top five hashtags I was able to get thirty five hundred more tweets, but I cannot tell whether those thirty five hundred is an eighty percent recall or ninety percent recall. Yeah, go go ahead, Prati.
So, uh, if you are looking at uh, evaluating user interests modeling, uh, ignoring uh, filtering or recommendation systems, it's hard to have a large scale study, right? Uh, I think uh, even in our study, we asked uh, quite a few people in terms of we sent our emails at IBM and Rice Data and we found 37. However, for uh, recommendation system, yes, uh, we can. And uh, I do think uh, what we evaluated the user interest in terms of the recommendation is, uh, is significant because uh, <clears throat> if you look at uh, the, sli the slide 29, uh, we are able to test our recommendation system with 6,000 and 9,000 leads. Right. Uh, if you are, uh, and those are the kind of uh, numbers you will look at even in uh, recommendation systems in terms of entity based recommendation systems too. So the number of test set is more important here. Am I, am I clear? Hello? Uh, I can barely hear you. Yeah. Oh, you okay. Okay, okay. So, uh, the issue is if we have to do uh, this evaluation, that's uh, the user study, it's really hard to get a large scale user study. Although we send it to a lot, lot of users, uh, it would be hard for them to annotate each and every category of interest we provide. However, we can utilize these interests to a recommendation system and uh, what, what we did here and evaluate. Although I've just I've utilized the same 37 users, if you look at the test set, there are around 15,000 uh, test set for us. So I'm, I am actually doing a fairly large scale study here. It's not about the user, it's about the test set for recommendations. If, if, if you were to rethink uh, evaluation in a iterative way, and in this uh, using using user behavior, like all these uh, search engine or uh, you know social media websites, their evolution is like uh, they make a change and they see what people do. They're not going to oh yeah a, a, yeah AB yeah, uh, testing yeah. right right. Uh, so how would you, how would that change? If you were to do that? How could you can you do that? Probably if I was in Twitter, yes, I would have surely tried to put this approach there and try to recommend leads using their, uh, their they kind of have, uh, they have the all tweets and popular tweets for users these days, right? So can I recommend these tweets as popular tweets for them and how well would they use those can be done using AB testing, which gives a more practical view of evaluation, but not a precision recall kind of evaluation. So again, <coughs> coming back to that uh, abstraction level, mm -hmm. I thought you had a graph that allowed you to compare different approaches and which yes. one yes, I do. Uh, is better. I thought that was missing in the final presentation. Yes, I didn't add that in the final presentation. Uh, I, I don't think I have it in the presentation. I have it in the thesis, I think. That's what... Uh, adds to your argument you might want to show. Sure. Uh, related comments actually, if you have a child with uh, frequency of the uh, frequency of the model that you model Yes, that's exactly Go ahead. I was just going to say I don't think you have a I'll, I'll actually open that. Well, I think we can go ahead with the questions uh, while I'm opening that. The slide deck that you showed me, isn't it? Oh, we, we saw that in the thesis.
technique of adaptation? Do you run the framework uh, like certain like in a, in a frequency, or is it uh, continuous feedback from the user which says yes or no? You're right. Uh, the evaluation, at least the evaluation setup uh, we we did here was uh, uh, okay. I'll, I'll I'll probably reiterate the question. So you're saying that can I can I utilize this? in real time, as and when new tweets or new information about the user comes in, can I build the system with the existing one? I have not tested that. Okay. Uh, what the evaluation setup, what we did was for each user, uh, we, uh, we actually uh, built the profile and then tested it. And the profile was not uh, varying over time, right? Facebook can 
have so much of prominence, this can have. Yeah, I guess I'm imagining that there's a type to these scores, like a type score for Twitter. Twitter or type score for, for exactly. And then these type differences need to show up in the activation function, right? Because that's ultimately how you decide, how you quantify whether or not something is interesting or not. It's, it's just hypothetical. How would yeah, I'm, I'm, how would you I'm adapt just to trying to imagine uh, how activation function would change because if my scores here reflect all the all the requirements which you are uh, mentioning, the activation function is just adapting Wikipedia, right? So if you're treating these multiple forums, all things being equal, right. a weight on Twitter is the same as a weight on, weight Facebook. on Facebook. Do you think that's realistic? No, that's no, I don't think so. Because some people are not active on Twitter I at agree. all. And some I people agree. are more active on Facebook. So, uh, And in which case, if you are... If so you're, somehow, uh, if I post something about Seattle Mariners on Twitter, maybe for some reason that should mean more because I use Twitter more or less often compared to if I say it on Facebook. Yeah. Yes, that's the kind of learning which we might want to do, say, saying that which social network is prominent to you or not. Yeah, so it's kind of... Well, what happens is that you uh, end up using different uh, uh, you know, network for different purposes. Uh, LinkedIn is almost an entirely professional thing. I don't post any uh, you know, trends and everything there. Uh, Facebook is largely trends, uh, with occasional following uh, uh, the content that is professional in nature mm -hmm. and or some professional marketing kind of content. So I think the purpose for each of them is different, and each of them are going to be different hierarchies, obviously. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, the subject matter side is because people are different than uh, LinkedIn are different than uh, Facebook, for sure, a lot more from the Yes, yes. So that, that will occur. Um, um, but I, I, I believe that, um, uh, it is appear to me that uh, it's practical uh, for someone to write a tool. Uh, let's assume like now the access issue is solved. And the access issue will not be good at you because you are not using any assistance, you are only using a tool. So all of those are going to come into this tool mm -hmm. and then you are using the tool to essentially create a, a snapshot across your thing. And even if you segregate from different network uh, and uh, just uh, uh, recommend from each of the network separately, that's a perfectly fine mm -hmm. option. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be merged into one single thing. Mm -hmm. um, because people you know, well, right now I want to consume my social content, uh, you know, family, friends, and family, right now I want to go on uh, daily's work of uh, professional news that uh, family is social and social content. Right. And, and in that particular context, um, um, I think cross platform issues are. One thing that I see not at, you know, handled by anybody in our group so far is this active engagement of the user. Exactly how you consume the content uh, is not factored in. Yes. Uh, and building the tools that actually will monitor the consumption of the content uh, and factoring the, putting that algorithm in the ranking and recommending will be, uh, I think, uh, I think it's a significant challenge. Yes, I think it's a significant challenge to get that data. I I don't think companies would. Uh, no, you are. It's just your involvement, and you are. If you are using the tool, then you can get the data. You are, you're going to have your uh, you know uh, evaluators uh, use your tool and uh, observe the engagement over a period of month. Yeah, I mean, not, I mean, a lot of people mm -hmm. basically don't generate data, which is what you're trying to use to abstract from. But even viewing history, like click through, oh, that is uh, kind of thing. Uh, that's exactly how Netflix or uh, or Twitter mm -hmm. evaluates. Yeah. I don't think they would care about what the precision and recall is. They would care about whether a person has watched a movie or not. So it, on, no, on, even if they read those posts that actually shows their interest, yes, and, and you have ignored it. They can do a kind of plugin which does one extra layer that that monitors what people read, and that actually is a better indication of their interest to do that. In addition to what they post, how 
how is it different from the uh, uh, am I missing anything in the No, question? the way I understood your thing was that you, you, you take what people write mm -hmm. and then you uh, detect entity, mm -hmm. then you abstract from it using the hierarchical mm -hmm. interest graph mm -hmm. and then use that to recommend other, mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that if I do not post but I continuously read some uh, under some topical area Got and it. are we missing it or uh, uh, is there a simple way to extend your work to take that? To me, that is an important. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to rephrase the question and just uh, uh, let me know if this is right or wrong. Uh, so, you're saying that uh, you might not post what yeah, you want to read. I'm just a passive reader. Yes. Okay, okay. That's, uh, yeah, that, but I still want you to recommend me things that interest Yeah, that, that's a hard task, at least uh, as far as uh, academia is concerned. That's a hard task to evaluate. Because I can, un unless I get to get a system where there are a lot of users and I can see that they are clicking on something or they are doing something, I won't be able to get that data. And I uh, I partially agree with Dr. Shen that we have to build a system where users use it for like a month or two and then get the click, click through uh, data and then say, okay, yeah, I tested this algorithm, it worked like this. I tested a better algorithm and it performed worse or Better. No, you can't just put a simple layer which says I just take that Twitter content, just show it through my window and I'll register your click. I, you show me the same same content, but now you can hold on to my click. Yes, we can do that. Hypothetically, if you had that data, how would it fit into this scheme? Uh, the Instead of having tweets that I wrote, you have tweets that I write. How would you fit it in? The there? test recommendation would completely change. Right? I would have the tweets which you have clicked through in the test uh, data set and I'll try to recommend those again. So, in recommended tweets, if you want to incorporate temporal aspects for an uh, For me, at this point of time, if I have to in a, uh, utilize the temporal aspect, it is again in the scores which are down there. I've just used normalized frequency. But I can use a temporal decay here and say that since the person put this tweet after this one, I would give more importance to Reds and Sox than Mariners. Right. That can be done. Uh, evaluating temporal aspect is a challenge here. And then you have to be periodic because it every year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I think at this stage, uh, 